Welcome to another hour of Gate City Chronicles. I'm Kevin Avard, your host. I uh, have a couple of special guests here with me today, uh, Pastor Mike Ratton and uh, uh, Steve Whitmer. 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 Okay. <laughs> and uh, I want to invite, invite you to the show again uh, so quickly because uh, it is the Easter period, it's the Easter holiday, and I wanted to have a little discussion about you know, the significance of it and uh, keep, uh, you know, keep it uh, at, at a point where uh, we're, we're thinking about it properly or you know, have a perspective anyway. Mm. So uh, welcome to the show again. Good Thank to you. be here. All right. Good to be here. So, Steve, tell us a little bit about yourself, your, your involvement with, the, uh, with, with Pastor Mike, with the, with the church, with the, the scriptures. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a pastor in Pepperell, Massachusetts, so just about 10 minutes away from where Mike pastors in Hollis. Um, and I've been at Pepperell Christian Fellowship for three and a half years now. Mm -hmm. um, we're a church of about 170 right on Main Street in Pepperell and an evangelical Bible-believing church. Okay. Wonderful. Well, welcome. Yeah, thank you. And uh, of course, you, you're you're actually you're an old standard here now already. Well, yeah, I've been here being, once. This, this is being your <laughs> second two. time. <laughs> yes, <laughs> number two. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, uh, again, it, it's the Easter holiday season, and uh, I uh, I have a personal readings on on a weekly basis, daily basis. Uh, I went through the Book of John recently, and then uh, moved right over to the Book of uh, Acts, and I'm actually um, on my daily reading. It's about, I think I'm in chapter 17. But uh, when you read the Gospels, you, you get a flavor for, the, the, you know, the, you know uh, about the Messiah and the significance of, of, of Christ. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, we know how it all, the story all ends, right? He was crucified, and then he was uh, buried, and then he rose again. But nowadays, we seem to be worried about chocolates and about Easter bunnies and, and about uh, things that, that uh, can actually get us off that message. Mm -hmm. And uh, some, you know, some people don't have a problem with it. Some people do. It's like the, the, the Christmas story. But mm -hmm. uh, I want to bring it back into a little bit of focus about really what is, what is the, the whole story behind Easter and the Passover. And, and uh, I'll, I'll let you take, uh, take over that. Uh, mm -hmm. I, th I think first it's it's important to have these holidays, if we want to call them holy days, uh, opportunities where we stop and we we rethink, we look at the crucifixion, we look at the resurrection, and we renew our mind. Actually, it's it's a good thing and it's a not so good thing. It should be a, an everyday occurrence for the Christian. It should be uh, Easter every day. It should be um, the death and resurrection, the gospel every day. So there's, however, I think it's important uh, that we do have these special days. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's kind of where I'm at with it. I, I think it's good, and I think it, it's a great time to rally people to focus their, their minds and their heart, not on Easter bunnies, but on the crucifixion. Mm. And that's a hard thing, I think, for people, especially in our day. Mm -hmm. I think also, Mike, uh, you know, often people uh, who, who know something about Jesus um, and who read the Gospels think of Jesus mainly as a moral teacher. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he came and he said, said good things, um, and we want to be like him. We want to imitate him and, and love our enemies or, you know, welcome children. Um, but if you read the Gospels, if you look at the earliest Gospel, the Gospel of Mark, um, and just the, the way it lays out the story of Jesus, um, Mark 1 to 11, chapters 1 to 11, focus on Jesus' life. Mark, Mark 1 to 10, I should say. And then Mark 11 through 16, focus mm. on the last week of Jesus' yeah. life. In, in other words, like the, the pace of the story that the earliest gospel tells, um, you get uh, uh, 10 chapters devoted to uh, three years of ministry or so, and then... Obviously, Mark, as a gospel writer, thinks the death of Jesus, the last week of his life, is so important that he slows way down yeah. um, and gives six chapters or so to, to just the last week of Jesus' life. So even the way he constructs his gospel mm -hmm. uh, demonstrates that he thinks the death is crucially important. It's not just the teaching of Jesus, it's that he came to die. Right. I'm, I'm reminded, I'm back into the book of John right now where John the Baptist uh, sees Jesus afar off and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. To you and me, 
who are, who are not of that culture back then, yeah, we kind of fly over our heads like, oh, well, he's a gentle person. What a nice thing to say about, about this nice, gentle person. But significantly, the lamb was considered to be the sacrifice. It would, it would be, you know, what they would have in, in their mind back then. The lamb was the animal of sacrifice and the animal for sacrifice. And when he is the lamb, uh, behold, the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, there is this automatic in their minds image, I would think, back to uh, all those, well, he is. He is the, all, all the lambs before that were sacrificed, all, all the sacrifices point to the one sacrifice who is Christ. And, you know, that's the whole, kind of the Old, Old Testament shadow, Jesus being the fulfillment of that. In the first story, which uh, comes to my mind when I think about an Old Testament reference to the lamb, is when, when Abraham was going to offer his son Isaac mm. up on, uh, and he was told to take him to a certain mountain, and he, there he'd be, he would be sacrificed. And the wood's there, the oil's there, we've got the light, and, and Isaac says to his father, what about the, uh, the sacrifice? Where, where are we going to get that? Mm. And Abraham says, God will provide, provide us with the sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. To me, that would be one of the, the first pictures of the up-and-coming sacrifice that would actually accomplish what, what God had intended for, for us from the beginning. Yeah, there are pictures in, in the Old Testament of the, the sacrifice of Jesus. But uh, on the other hand, um, it helps me to, as I'm reading the New Testament and thinking through what, what the Old Testament uh, expectation would be or what Jews in Jesus' day would be expecting, um, also to realize how unexpected and how surprising uh, mm. Jesus' death was. Uh, mm -hmm. The death of the Messiah is a radically unexpected thing. Uh, so, so, you know, there are, there are a bunch of other Jewish writings from around the time of Jesus, a, a couple hundred years before and up to uh, his birth and life, uh, who, and these other Jews are thinking about a Messiah. They're hoping for a Messiah. And many of those expectations are of a political conquering figure. Uh, so there's a, a writing called the Psalms of Solomon mm -hmm. uh, and that's expecting a, a Davidic-like king, a king in the, in the line of David, who's, who's going to uh, overthrow Roman rule uh, and certainly not a suffering, dying Messiah. Mm -hmm. But when we look at, uh, as, I'm, as I'm back in the book of Acts now, and the Apostle Paul goes to the Bereans, and he says they were more noble than those of, the, of Thessalonians because they studied the Scriptures to see whether those things were true. So in hidden in the Old Testament are references to a suffering Christ. And the, the, the only point that, the only thing that I can, in my own mind, if I was to go into the Old Testament and say, well, you, here he was supposed to, to, to die and rise again, maybe it would be something to the effect where I would not leave my, his holy one to suffer or to see corruption, meaning that when he, when he was crucified, his, his flesh would not be corrupted. Yeah. But the, uh, and I think there's an, uh, an Isaiah one. Uh, Isaiah 64, Isaiah in 53, that whole the suffering, the suffering servant area of, of Isaiah is very full of, a, a picture of someone, the servant, dying and suffering incredibly. Well, even, even the passage of Abraham, uh, if you follow that whole story, Abraham walks, is told to, to go to this Mount Moriah, and it's like 50-mile journey. Mount Moriah is Jerusalem, is the, the very same place that Jesus would one day die on the cross. And so the images that are there, uh, to me, are profound. Uh, the you know, the Isaiah passage, um, he was despised and rejected of men, oh, yeah. a man of, of sorrow, acquainted with grief. We, you know, it just goes on and talks about this um, hor horrible sacrifice, this one, it, it, and, and probably the passage that just always throws me, it pleased the Lord to bruise his son, um, just is, is pretty profound in that Isaiah passage. Isn't there one also in, in the book of Psalms, uh, I think it's in 20... I don't know, is it 25 where it talks about the pierced hands? 22. And, yeah, Psalm 22? Psalm 22, which Jesus quotes on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting scripture when he says that. So, so yeah, it, it's there to see, I think, if you have eyes to see it. But, but uh, I think the earliest followers of Jesus saw it 
saw his death in the Old Testament after his death. Yes. You know, even John the Baptist, um, when he was imprisoned, right. he sent to Jesus and said, are you really the one to come? Because this is certainly not what I was expecting. When the Messiah comes, you don't expect to still be in prison. Mm -hmm. You expect to be released from prison. Right. The Messiah is supposed to conquer, not be conquered. He's supposed to bring God's judgment, not receive God's judgment. And uh, Jesus in, in the Gospels, very clear in the Gospel of Mark, as he's journeying closer to Jerusalem three times, predicts his death, his suffering and death. And the disciples don't understand what he's talking about. So here we have this, this Messiah that's supposed to be coming in to have this great victory. What did he actually accomplish then when he was crucified on the cross? What did he accomplish? What, is it for Israel or was it for all of mankind? His, his, well, first of all, if we take a step back and what Steve is referring to is I think their mindset was a kingdom, a freedom from Roman rule, and that was their mindset of the kind of the extent of, of the Christ. He would come, he would kick out Rome, you know, they would have their kingdom, their little plot of land. And when Jesus, you know, he came not for that kingdom, he came for a greater kingdom. And, and when, he, when, he, when he came, he came because man, in essence, our, our problem uh, was not Rome, our problem was our sin. And so when Jesus comes to this world, he comes to save sinners. That's his purpose. He came to seek and to save those who are lost. That's what it, it, it says in Scripture. Uh, so his, his focus is on a, a people who are dead in their sin, Ephesians tells us. Uh, you know, lost, Scripture tells us. Without God, um, we are, in essence, bearing the wrath of God. We are currently, before we come to faith in Christ, we are, uh, we, we are those who will endure the wrath of God for eternity. And so Jesus comes as God's gift to us um, to save us from our sin. Uh, he says, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve, to give my life a ransom for many. I, I came to to be that substitute, the propitiation for sin. So those are the kind of the terminologies. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think it, people might, might ask, you know, why did Jesus need to die? Um, if the answer is he came to give his life as a ransom for many, well, why, why did God need a ransom? You know, if, if human beings are sinful and have sinned against God, uh, why can't God just forgive? You know, like if I wrong you, um, you don't need to punish me or punish Mike, do you, in, in order to, um, to make, make right the, the wrong that I've done to you. And I, something that's been very helpful for me in thinking this through is realizing that actually if I wrong you seriously, you know, if, if one person sins against another in a, in a real serious way, then actually somebody does have to pay a price in order to restore the relationship. Um, you have a choice. Either if I've wronged you, either you can pursue me and seek vengeance uh, mm -hmm. and, and enact justice, or if you, if you want to restore the relationship and, and decide to forgive me and the wrong is serious enough, uh, you will have to bear suffering by forgiving me. In, in other words, you know, if, if someone is deeply wronged and they extend mm -hmm. forgiveness, then uh, in, in essence, what they're doing is taking the hurt upon the themselves. There's, there's kind of a death when you forgive someone and give up your right uh, to exact justice mm -hmm. upon them. So either you deal out justice or you receive pain and suffering yourself. And if we remember that Jesus, who dies on the cross, is himself God, mm -hmm. uh, I think this makes sense that, that at the cross, God is taking upon himself uh, the pain and suffering that sin against him has caused, rather than uh, inflicting justice upon others, exacting justice upon others. Uh, he's, he's taking it into himself. So here we have the condition of the world and, uh, and the fallen state of the world, whether there's, you know, there's murders, lying, the whole nine yards, all the evilness and wickedness, and God sends his son and offers him up. Sends him, it allows him through his providence to be to show that that number one he is God, and yet people still rejected him. It, 
until, other than the, the disciples, that the, the people that were following him. He's crucified openly, where Pilate says, I find no fault in this man. And yet he was delivered to the cross. Explain to me how God planned all this. How, how could all these complexities be met on, from the time of him promising a Messiah in the book of Genesis all the way through the Old Testament until Christ on the cross? All that time elapsed, all the, the, the pain and, and, and of the world that, that, were, that was coming up, God saw all that stuff, and yet none of it was taken him by surprise. He's sovereign. Nothing happens by accident. His will is not being frustrated. I, I'm, I'm kind of overwhelmed at, that, at the whole story of mankind up to that point, where there, there's the... Well, I don't want to get too complicated, I guess. But in the whole process of, of this, when Christ is crucified, why aren't all of mankind then just forgiven and, and everything is just forgotten? W what takes place next? Why, why, the, the, why the resurrection? Why the crucifixion? Why, why can't everybody say, well, you know, okay, the sacrifice happened. Uh, you know, geez. Well, I think you take a step back and you have to say, okay, who is God? And that God is just and that God is holy. I think you have to start there. God is sovereign, that word you used, and that, that he controls all things. But he is just and he is holy. That's uh, a motivation, at least at one part. He has to be just. And so that justice was met out on Jesus when, uh, for our sin. And so that's how, you know, I, th I think it's important that you, anyway, you take that kind of step back and you say, okay, who is God in this? And that's kind of the why's, the why reason that some of these things had to take place. Um, you know, some of them are bigger than, some of those purposes are bigger than I am, for, for one. You know, why does God, well, I, we could use the word love. I mean, I, I don't, I can't comprehend that kind of love. I can't comprehend forgiveness like he is, has offered to us and given to us. Um, we are called by God. You know, his calling itself is, is like, why me? You know, um, I was chosen. I was, you know, as, as a believer, I'm made holy because of what Jesus has done. It's not my holiness. I have no righteousness. I have nothing to offer, nothing to give to this. It's all of Christ. Why? I, I don't have a category for that. At least not in my humanness, um, you know. Yeah, in the in the story, I think you ask, you know, where does it go? Why does it need to go beyond the the cross? Why does something else need to happen? Uh, I think where you're going is the resurrection, right. and mm -hmm. and the cross without the resurrection is uh, is meaningless. Um, the the resurrection, I think, is the it's the it's the public vindication of Jesus that uh, if if as Mike said, you know, Jesus' self-understanding and, and certainly the Bible's teaching about the cross is that at the cross, Jesus is bearing the wrath of God. He's taking judgment upon himself. Uh, the, the resurrection is God's vindication that Jesus has successfully borne the judgment of God, and therefore he can be raised again from the dead. Uh, Jesus, essentially, at the cross, goes through hell, literally goes through mm -hmm. hell. He takes upon himself infinite judgment. I think that's why it's important that Jesus is both God and man. If he's not man, he can't die. If he's not God, he can't bear infinite judgment because only God can bear infinite judgment. And so when he, when he, once he does that, uh, he's, God raises him from the dead. So the cross is the, the supreme demonstration of the love of God. The resurrection is always, almost always spoken of in the New Testament as a sign of God's power. It's the power of God that raises Jesus from the dead. And it's a sign that the cross is sufficient, um, that Jesus has accomplished what he, he came to do and he came to die. So let me ask you then this, then would it be the greatest insult to God for an individual to say, listen, I don't need Jesus. I'm good enough. I give to my neighbors. I'm very kind to people. I give to the poor. I do all these good things and God will accept me just the way I am. If, if the cross is not necessary, if there's any other way, then it's the cruelest act in the history of the universe. 
God would, would kill his perfect son, and it didn't need to happen. Right. Mm -hmm. But if the cross is necessary, if there's no other way, then it's the greatest act of love in the history of the universe. So with, armed with this knowledge, what does somebody have to do to make this work for them? I mean, okay, you, all right, I understand. I'm a sinner. I understand that mankind is evil. I've done bad things, you know, in my life. I, I believe in God. I believe Jesus is the Christ. Uh, now what? Where do you go from here? How, how do you make that work for you? Well, the Bible says to repent and believe the gospel. Okay. Okay. I think that's as simple as I can get it. Repent means what I've, what I've trusted in before, my good works, um, my goodness. I repent of that. I repent of my sin, my rejection of Christ. I believe that he came to this earth, that he as God came to this earth and, and died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin, that he rose again the third day, uh, to new life. I believe that he did that for me. And I believe that is, you know, what do we ever want to call it? Prayer faith, trust. Um, you know, does it happen exactly? There's, there's no magic words. There's no anything written out exactly that, that way. But I think it is a trusting, a falling upon what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross as payment for your sin and trusting that alone. And trust is a great word. You know, I, I, um, I think some folks think if I just pray a prayer, if I say certain mm. words, or if I walk an aisle, or if I just believe something in my head, then that's faith. And that's not the, the way the New Testament talks about faith. Right. Faith is trust. It's like, you know, the, the trust games you play in the office where um, you, you're supposed to fall back and, and you, you need to believe that someone will be there mm. to catch you. Um, if, if you don't actually trust that they will catch you, you, you won't fall. So, so biblical faith, biblical trust is actually casting yourself upon Jesus. It's, it's saying, it's not just believing something in your head, it's, it's actually resting your life mm -hmm. upon Jesus. What if I've been a good person all my life and yet I still realize that you know, I don't have a relationship with God, I, I want to make sure I go to heaven. Done, haven't done anything, I haven't, uh, you know, uh, murdered anybody or stolen a whole lot of things, you know, relatively decent life. Uh, but, you know, I want to make sure that I go to heaven. What's, what do I, how do I exercise this faith? Well, I, I think the first, the first <laughs> thing you do is recognize that the premise yeah. is wrong. <laughs> and that e even though, I, I actually, I think the most dangerous position you can be in is if you think that you haven't done very, very much that's all that bad. Mm -hmm. um, the, the way the Bible talks about sin is that sin is primarily a vertical reality, and I think we, for, we, we, we miss how significant our sin is when we think of it only as a horizontal thing, so, something I do to you or something I do to mm -hmm. you. And, and we forget that the times that we've sinned against each other are actually primarily times we've sinned against God. Right. So the Bible's full of this idea. Um, David, in Psalm 51, after he commits adultery and kills a man, says to God, against you and you only have I, I sinned. sinned yeah. right. and, and he says that not because he didn't sin against the woman he committed adultery with and her children and her husband by killing him, but because the, the main direction of his sin was a vertical sin. And so he's killed God. The way, the way I think about the significance of this is that the, the, the uh, importance of our sin, like the degree of our sin, is a function of the preciousness of the one we sin against. So... The example I've used in the past is if, if I go into a museum and, uh, and, and I'm, looking real, you know, I'm looking closely at a famous painting and on an impulse I whip a pair of scissors out of my pocket and start stabbing the, the painting and te tearing it up, the consequences of that action are go going to be severe because the, the painting is precious. Mm -hmm. It's a serious sin. If I go into the museum gift shop and find a postcard with the same painting on it and do the same thing with the scissors, I may get charged a dollar and thrown out of the museum gift shop, but it's, I'm doing essentially the same thing, but, but I'm sinning, a, a sinning against a, a valuable object if it's the painting and not a very valuable object if it's a postcard. And when we sin against each other, what we need to realize is that we're sinning against the, pic, the painting, not just yeah. the postcard. <laughs> you know, the, right. our, our horizontal sins are our sins against God and the infinitely valuable one 
And therefore, even what we think of as a little sin is not a little sin. It's uh, an infinitely serious sin. So if I'm talking about uh, uh, Pastor Mike behind his back and just assassinating his character because of all the bad things that he's done, you know, we're, we're on air here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, it, that, that, that's sinning against him, but... It's, really it's also sinning, sinning against, against God you know, because Mike is made in God's image. Right. Uh, Mike, uh, God loves uh, Mike. You know, I, one of the most memorable, memorable things I've heard uh, in recent months was um, a Christian speaker who said, your, your wife is not, not it, it's not just you that's God's son. Um, God, God is not just your father. God is your father-in-law. In other words, God is the mm -hmm. father of your wife, and the way you treat your wife affects God. Mm -hmm. So it's a misconception to be comparing our goodness with each other. It has to be, can be compared with... Well, there, there is a passage even in the Old Testament that says uh, that all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. You know, we're talking, you know, is every, our, every thought, you know, if, if the great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might, you know, no one, I don't care who they are, none of us arrive at that. And probably the most dangerous place that we find ourselves is being religious and thinking that we are good enough. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably the, the most dangerous place you can find yourself. Religious and lost. Somebody who's trusting in their goodness, in their whatever um, system of, of religion that they hold to. And you know, different churches have different kind of means of getting, you know, if I do this, this, or I don't do that and that. You know, that to me is just a dead end. Well, it is in scripture. You know, it's only through Christ. It's only as we understand we have nothing to offer and Christ has everything to offer. Every, he's, he's, he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. That No one comes to the Father except through Christ. I remember the, the, the ending of the story on the crucifixion where there's two thieves. Mm -hmm. They're on the cross and one of, the, one of the thieves said, you know, save yourself. You saved others. Let's see if he saves himself. And the other thief says, what? Lord, remember me in your kingdom? Mm -hmm. And to me, that's a, a, a perfect example of our state, that we're both are helpless, mm -hmm. both are stuck there because of something they've done. Yeah. One sees, you know, yeah. the bad that he's done. Mm -hmm. He comes to himself and he says, hey, wait a minute. Yeah, time's yeah. almost up here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, and he calls on, on Jesus to remember him in his kingdom. Mm -hmm. And the other one had the exact same opportunity and had the same facts saw the same things. It was just a matter of choice. Mm -hmm. The parable of the, the prodigal son is, is also convicting yeah, because the, we think of the, the bad son as the younger brother who, who goes away, and the good son as the older brother who stays and is faithful to his father. But uh, Tim, Tim Keller, pastor in New York City, has helped me to see that mm -hmm. at the end of that parable that Jesus is telling, the, one, the son who's been reconciled to the father is the bad younger son, and the son who is not reconciled to the father at the end of the parable is the good older son, and it's actually his goodness that separates him from the father. The, the badness of the younger son leads him to repentance. Right. The, the goodness, the righteousness of the older son is what makes him resentful and bitter toward his father and his younger brother, and at the end of that parable, he's outside. He, he's not partying uh, with the father the way the younger your brother is. So, so there's really hope for the people that say, you know, I'm not going to go to church because if I were to walk into that church, it would fall down on my head. Uh, you know, maybe I was a, a druggie or a, a, a hooker or a, a, a murderer. I was in prison. I did drugs when I was a kid or, you know, I, I, and the list goes on and on and on. And those, those people say, look, I can't go to church. You're not going to make me one of those holy ones. That thing will just fall right down on my head. Easter is about hope for these people. Well, read, read, read Jesus' life. Jesus, over and over, his harshest words are towards those who think that they're good enough, those who, who were religious but lost. His gracious words are to those who, are, who understand they're sinful, who understand that they, they are in need. And if, if anything, you're closer to the kingdom when you, when you understand just how bad you are, when you understand just how sinful you are, that's, that's a great first step 
to, to grasping what Christ, then you go to, to see what Christ has done for that sin. Uh, but if you think you're good enough, if you think that somehow you know, your pile of good outweighs your bad, you're in deep trouble, deep weeds, as far as Scripture is concerned. So if I go to church, it doesn't necessarily guarantee I'm going to heaven. No. Nope. And I volunteer for the PTA. And I volunteer to bake cookies for people that need, need to bake cookies. and <laughs> All that stuff doesn't earn your way to heaven. Nobody becomes a Christian because they enter into any particular church or go through motions of a church. You know, I, my prayer for my people and for young people who grow up is that they have, to, they have to come to faith in Christ himself. There are no grandchildren. There are only those who've come to faith and those who do not. And those who have, have embraced the cross, uh, first of all, acknowledge their own sinfulness, repent of their sin, acknowledge Christ as the only way, and those who have not. That's, that's the end of the story. There's, you know, there's all kinds of religions, but... Uh, this is one religion where you cannot force it down somebody's neck. No. You either accept Christ or you're going to die. That doesn't work, right? That doesn't get you to no. heaven, right? No. Uh, or that's one thing that, that I, think, I find that is misconstrued amongst many. You mean because, because it needs to be a, a, a voluntary thing. You need to choose right. well, rather than have Well, because of the history of, of the church in sure. years, and, and not, just the, yeah. not just the church, but also many other religions where they say, look, you either accept my, my faith or you're going to prison or you're going to die. And that's yeah. happened all across the board. But that's really muddied the waters about Christianity because Christianity has to be a person in their heart, in their mind, being convinced of the truth of the scripture. Yeah. Christianity is about us going to someone and say, I will die for you, would you accept Jesus? That's the pattern of our, our mm -hmm. Lord. It's not, uh, you, you will, will die, die unless you right. believe. Even now, though there's been a history of, of, of just the opposite in, in, some, in some quarters of, again, of our... Again, in the name of religion, a lot of things, a lot of bad things happen. Uh, but a true understanding of the cross that's not, that it's, it's like Steve says, you know, I will die myself so that you understand the truth. Right. Um, not, I can't just baptize you and then, you know, wave a magic wand and, and you're in. You, it has to be a personal uh, relationship that you have with Christ. And that's, the apostles proved that time and time yeah, again. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the, the example of Jesus is, is so extraordinary. Uh, the way he related to the people in his life. So, Early on in his ministry, he had, he had called uh, Levi a tax collector, and he was eating at his house with tax collectors and sinners, probably people who weren't ceremonially clean and also were not living according to the law. They were probably blatant sinners. Mm -hmm. And some of the religious folks, the scribes of the Pharisees, were offended that he was eating with them. And what he says is just extraordinary. I think He, he says, um, I did not come to call those who are well, um, but I came to call those who are sick, and I didn't come to call the righteous, I came to call sinners. In other words, he's saying it's not, it's not he's heightening the problem for them. Mm -hmm. It's not just, it's not a random thing that he showed up and he happened to be eating with them. He says, I've come from heaven. This is my mission. This mm -hmm. is exactly the, the whole yeah. purpose of my life is to be with these people. So he, he offends the religious types because of who he hangs out with. But exactly at the same time, if, if we think about what he's saying, He's saying these folks I'm with are sick, and they are sinners. And so there's a, there's a remarkable combination of truth and love in his words. He, I, I think if we come to Jesus, all of us need to be prepared to, to believe that we are sick and we are sinners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but we also can eat at the table with him. You know, there's yeah. a place at the table. There's a welcome and a fellowship and an offer. He's a doctor. He's, he's offering to make us well. Well, we're going to end on, on this one last note on, with dining because I remember at, after the, the, the resurrection, uh, Jesus was standing by a fireplace and he sees Peter in a boat and he says to the apostles, come and dine. Yeah. Did he not? Yeah. Well, There's a song that says, once you're in a me, now seated at your table. That's who we are as believers. Once you're in a me, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. Pastors, I really want to thank you for coming on board and we'd like to have you come back again. Talk a little to. bit about uh, other issues if, uh, that, that may be pressing during the day. And sure. We look forward to it. Love and happy to. Easter. Thank you. You God too. God bless you. All right. And
thank you for joining us, and we'll uh, see you next week. Mm -hmm. And welcome back to Gate City Chronicles for our next guest, uh, Mr. Scott McCullough. Yes. How are you doing, Scott? Not too bad. Welcome aboard. Appreciate you coming on the show. Now, I understand, you're welcome. I understand you're going to be having your own show here on yes. Access Nashua. Let's talk a little bit about that. What's going to be the name of your program? Uh, Special Talk. Special Talk. Okay. And that'll be a weekly program? Yep. Tuesday, 4 p.m. Tuesday, 4 p.m. What is the whole message about special talk? What was the trying to get Special Olympics athletes to come on and talk about their experiences with Special Olympics and have to actually taping. I'm actually going out to have my camera crew, our camera crew, that's going to be going out to Portsmouth, New Hampshire this coming weekend. Actually, oh, interesting. To tape the uh, basketball tournament. Now, you're involved with uh, the Special Olympics. Yes, this will I be, am. This will be a, spe a Special Olympics uh, basketball yes. tournament? State basketball tournament. Wow. Basketball, Special Olympics State basketball tournament in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Will you be involved with the game or yes. are you going to cover it? Yes, I'm going to be in the game. I play. We don't do anything Friday. Saturday we play back-to-back -back games. And it's like... We play Manchester, we play Manchester, Claremont, Hopticon Hawks. Wow. And if we make it, and if we win all three, we make it to the championship round, and that one will decide the winner, whoever gets home, whoever doesn't give up the most points will win gold this year, nice. I hope. Nice. And then, then will it be a state competition where you go to and, and compete against another state, or is it all just for New Hampshire? Yes, for New Hampshire, pretty much. I've done, I've done a, I've done my first show on whenever the heck it was. I forgot when the heck it was now. You need a coffee. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how long have you been involved with Special Olympics? Uh, About thirty years, actually. Oh my gosh! Wow. Since you don't I look was that eight. old. So you're thirty-eight years old. Thirty-six. Thirty-six years old. All right. Do the math on that, Kevin. All right. Uh, so let's see. You're you're intending on having a special. You're an athlete, and as far as your involvement, uh, you're you're involved with with athletes um, throughout the state, or is it just here in Nashua? How how does? Yes, we got teams. For, we got a team because Pelham doesn't have a team. Hollis doesn't have a team. They all come to Nashua, and join Nashua, and they can. They, if they're interested in joining Nashua, they can go to our website, www.nashuaspecialolympics.org. They have to register first. That's the only problem. They have to register and get in contact with Dodie Mitchell as our local coordinator. Now, do you have to be a really good athlete to get involved with this, or can you just say, no, you, you know what, I want to learn how to play basketball? Yeah, you can basically come down and... Basically, our season's almost over, but if you want to come down, if you want to come down next year, it's uh, at the National Community College is where we do our basketball practices. Now, where is that? The, uh, Exit eight. Exit eight in Nashville. Okay. Yes. Uh, do you have volunteers that help out with the program as well, or other people get involved? Yep. With it? Uh, if they, if people wanted. People want to volunteer, they can either go to our website or go to www.sonh.org or they can call the Special Olympics office up in Manchester, 1-800-639-2608. Now, I, do you do just basketball or are there other... Sport? Basketball, bowling, cross-country skiing, wow. and track and field. In track and field, how about swim team? Anything on the? Nah. Team? No, no. <laughs> I don't a... like water. Okay. Right. I like jacuzzis. Jacuzzis? Well, there's water in there. Yeah. Oh yes. Um, let's see. Uh, now I heard that you were one of the hundreds that that ran the ocean for the penguin. Penguin plunge. You were one very of those. Very cold. Did you jump into that? We're yeah. We're talking about water, cold. right? Right. Yeah. It's very cold. I went in, got out. Wow. That was uh, that was this February. Oh yes, February fifth, actually. Now, was there a good turnout for that? 
Oh yeah, I say the high school plunge they said raised a lot of money. They raised, I forgot how much they said actually. Uh, we raised, they said we had over 1,000, 1,583 attending. Really? And they, like if people still want to, still people want to help me out, you can then go to, you have to go to First Giving if people want to. They can go to www.firstgiving.com and enter Scott McCullough and my page comes up. I have to raise over 500 if I want a gift card. How do you spell your last name, Scott? M-C-C-U-L-L-O-U-G-H. All right. Now, what is the Global Messenger, and, and how, did that, how did you become involved with these? Global Messenger, basically, somebody mentioned it to me, and I said, sure, it sounds like fun. Let's, I want to check it out, and it sounds like fun. I said, hey, what the heck? Became, I was a senior global, uh, beginner, junior, advanced. Now I'm a trainer also sometimes. if, Like, they'll call me up and they'll ask me to do a do a speech, tell them, please give me where I'm speaking, how many people, and I love it because I do several speaking engagements. I've done a TV, I've done TV with a Channel 13 actually. I've done radio interviews with Mike, I think is his first name. Okay, uh, Mike Ball? Uh, Mike... That? Uh, he has a show on Tuesdays, mm. like Bonacue. Okay. I did a radio show with him about Special Olympics. And if people want to get on your show, they're going to go to the website, or they're going to, or is there? A... Or they can contact Access Nashua. Okay. At six zero three five that six zero three five eight nine three one four one. Sorry, Dick. That's fine. I should know that by now. Now, for our, list, our, our people in the background, Dick is the guy who's running all the knobs in the background. Yes. Right? Uh, Dick Agnew, the program uh, manager there. He's, he's uh, doing a good job here. Oh, yes. And yeah. he will be the one that can tell him if he wants to be a guest, then they'll have to contact me. Dick knows how to contact me. He can send me an email, or they want to shoot me an email, what are the, some of the topics that you'll be talking about with some of your guests? What, what do you want to highlight? Uh, how special Olympics, how people with special needs can do anything they put their mind to. Right. And this gives them an opportunity to, to get out there and, and, and uh, live up to their potential. Oh, yes. That's right. why I got my camera, our camera crew, and I've already taped. Uh, I taped for my show, special talk I've done. Uh, the basketball assessments last are up in Keene. I've already done the Penguin Plunge, and that's going to be hopefully done pretty soon. <laughs> then <laughs> that, that, I'm sure that was probably pretty interesting. Yeah. No wonder you like hot tubs. That's it, <laughs> right? Hot tubs, I don't mind. Yeah. Swimming pools, eh. Yeah. Then I'm doing one. I'm actually having our camera crew cover the basketball, state basketball tournament this coming Saturday. Right. And I'll have coverage on that. I'm trying to, my, our camera crew is actually, he's right on the ball. He knows when to be there, yeah. what time. We inter, I interview, I interview people and I got a co-host that helps me. And she couldn't, she couldn't show up, but she said she apologized. She said, I'm sorry for not showing up. I said, it's okay. It happens to me all the time. That's fine. You know, well, it's, it's part of the... Told her I have to wing it. Yeah, we'll have to wing it. Well, we're, we're still trying to get a cupcake lady on here. Yeah, we need a yeah, cupcake we need lady. The cup, we need the cupcake lady. Go on, Dick. Work that, on that. Yeah, exactly. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Is there anything else you want the, the people to know about, about the Special Olympics here in Nashua? Uh, if you want to check it out, www. NashuaSpecialOlympics.org, O-R-G, click on where it says register, and it will say register, and then it will say you can register your name, address, phone, and so on, and 
then it will be allowing you on to the website. And it will go in and say, welcome to the National Special Olympics website. Hopefully people want to come on my special talk show because I'm trying to prove a point that people with hyper disorder can put their mind to anything. Yes. And I'm a Special Olympics board member also for the state of New Hampshire. I don't know if your audience knew that. I'm a Special Olympics board member, and I got to step down after 2013. My three-year term is up. So you've been very active in this whole, this whole process. That's, I really appreciate what you're doing. This is, this is actually very good, and it's, it's a nice way to reach out and uh, open up some doors for people that don't realize that they can. Yeah, as if they want to come down to the studio and check out the studio. It's located at 1-1 Riverside. 1-1 Riverside Drive, audience. And that will be located, not the first building, <laughs> the second building. <laughs> right. You come around to the back. There's a big sign that says, Nashua Community Television. Walk straight ahead. And on your, I think... It says, Access Nashville, you're always welcome to come down and maybe help out Ken Kevin. or help or help out Kevin with his show or if you want to help out with my show. I'm always looking for cameramen if they want to Volunteer help out. for editing as well. Uh, we, we could use some volunteers for that as well. Yeah, because we got to... Scott, if I can find this place, anybody can find this place. That's why they got to get a sign up yeah, exactly. over near the highway or something. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. And we're going to get the message out. And uh, if you folks want to be part of uh, the, the Special Olympics or uh, uh, Scott's show, uh, and the name of your show is? Special Talk. Special Talk. If you want to come on the show, please uh, come, come right down. This is a very uh, user-friendly studio, and we'd love to have you. So... Thank you for joining us, and until next week, stay tuned.